Okay. Tell us a little bit about your, your family and your uh, early life. My family. I grew up in Amsterdam. Um, I have two brothers. Um, my dad was actually never home, and um, so my mom kind of raised us. Um, my dad was also uh, much, pretty much an alcoholic, so when he was there, uh, it, was, it, was, it was not nice being at home. So um, all my, my brothers and I tried to escape the house as much as possible, as you can understand. Um, which actually led to the fact that um, I was out of the house by 16. Okay. Um, but after that, the relationship with my mom got better, and um, it's good now. She's still alive, so. But you were going out in Amsterdam. You were very young. You were, what, about 15 and going to the uh, bars? Yeah. How did that well, happen? <laughs> Amsterdam is, is the place where it all happened for gays. And um, I came out of the closet when I was end of 15, beginning of 16. So for me, it was easy. Um, to just discover everything at the early age and uh, being so close to it, close to everything. So yeah, it was more or less natural that you <laughs> that you hit the bars early when when you were living in Amsterdam. So, but you were you were keeping a bar. What, uh, you were a bar keeper, I guess they call it. Yeah, and you um, were only sixteen. No, I was seven. Look, the end of seventeen when I started working in the uh, bars. Okay. So. Uh, but still early, yeah. Um, I guess I just I just like being in gay bars. So, what gay bars do you remember from that time? From that time, um, I started working in the traffic. It was a small bar in Regensdwarsstraat. Uh, it's gone now, like most of the bars actually in Amsterdam. Um, after that, um, I did start. That did my study as well. So I would all work next to my study, and. Um, uh, I used to, after after the, the traffic, I started working for Manfred Langer in Club It, um, and also I still did my study. So that was about four or five years. Um, when I got back from the States, um, I started working in the cl in the clubs again. So I did it for a pretty long time. Tell us about the things you experienced. You were very young, and certainly some of the things you saw had to be eye opening. Um, yeah, some of the, some of the, I remember my first time I went into the Argos because I was really interested into leather, I figured out later. Um, I was about 17, I think, 17, 18, but I, di I didn't dare to go into the dark room. So I, I wanted it really, really much, but uh, I just didn't have the guts to do it. Um, yeah, more or less I'm not shocked that easily. You know. But the Argos was an iconic leather bar. Yeah. It was world famous. Yeah. What? Tell us about what you saw, what you experienced. There. What I experienced there was, um, I came in there, a very shy boy, and um, well, after a couple of years, that was gone. <laughs> I can tell you that. But um, no, it's like I said, uh, I was in there with a friend of mine, and who was also really getting into, into leather and um, yeah well we just we just discovered it and he eventually get the balls and get, get courage enough to go in. <laughs> but what did you see when you went in? Lots of guys in leather. Lots of guys in leather. Um, leather was kind of more or less the only fetish that people were really um, really into at those days. Um, you didn't see a lot of rubber, and you didn't see any sportswear at all. Uh, so it, it was, it was, yeah, there was all kinds of leather, but they were all in leather. It was interesting. <laughs> How long were you going there before you finally went into the basement? Uh, about three months. <laughs> what did you see in the basement? Um, what I saw in the basement was something uh, I was longing for for years already. Such as guys having sex, and uh, I think there was no other place in those times than to do it as in bars with, with the dark room. And um, I, yeah, I'm still, 
I, 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 at this this point, I, 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 this time, I still like dark rooms. I prefer dark rooms over internet sex. So, uh, how long were you going to the Argos before you actually went into the dark rooms? And what? Why did you do that? Um, because I was interested in having sex with other men, and I know it was happening down there. So um, I finally had courage enough to go downstairs and uh, figure it all out and see what's happening over there. And I kind of liked it, and I got into it. So it's what did you see? Uh, guys having sex, mostly. <laughs> Anything shocking? Mm, no, not really. It was, in those days, it was more... Uh, it was fucking and sucking and some S and M, but uh, definitely not the fisting thing like it is right now, and uh, more shocking things. But what other bars did you experience in Amsterdam at that time? Because a lot of the bars are gone. A lot of the bars are gone. Uh, like I said, the, the, the traffic bar when I started working is gone. The April is gone. Havana is gone. And those were all the, the bars in the Regulus Dwarstraat where we used to go out a lot. I actually had a double life in Amsterdam. One in the Warmoestraat and one in the Regulus Dwarstraat. Oh, okay. and, and one of the scenes I was working in and the other scene I was fucking in. So, yeah. uh. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a rule, no bondage on the first date. What, what is that? Um, I picked up the guy in the Argos the other night and... Um, we had some fun until uh, he asked me if he could tie me up. And as, in as interesting as I think everything is, especially the first time, I agreed to that. Um, and it all went wrong from there. Uh, he actually forced me to have sex when I didn't want to, want to anymore. So um, I was still young. I was 20, 20, 20 something. Um, but after that, for me, it's always no, rule number one, no bondage on the first day. And that, that's because of a bad experience. So if someone is viewing this interview and they want to experience bondage, do you have any advice for them? Take, do it with somebody that you trust and that you know. You mentioned that you moved to the United States when you were about 21 or so. Yeah. What took you there? Why did you go there? What took me there? Um, my school, actually. My, uh, I did an intern, intern, intern man, management, uh, management internship um, in San Diego, La Jolla, at the Marriott Hotels. I was doing the International School for Hospitality Management I, um, in The Hague, the hotel school The Hague, and uh, I, ha I had to do an internship. So that's more or less the reason that I, that I went there. Um, I stayed there for two years, um, and actually, I think San Diego is quite boring. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did was uh, I worked my days back to back most of the time. So eight days working, four days off, and then go up to San Francisco and see my friends over there and have some fun. Tell us about the San Francisco you experienced in those days. Uh, it was '92, so we just. For me, it was an, it's a nice city. I had a lot of friends there, but uh, on the other hand, the city was really depressed because of everything that happened in the years before. And um, but still, I had a lot of fun over there, and a lot of, lots of guys in leather. And um, I, it was a nice city. I love it. I still do. I think San Francisco was really in a state of change in the yeah. early nineties. Yeah. 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 Went from everything possible to nothing possible, actually. And, um, because of the laws, because of the, of the city, uh, of the government, uh, dark rooms weren't allowed anymore, so uh, all the clubs went underground. Uh, but it still happened, it never changed. Tell us a little bit about the underground clubs. I think that's happening more now. It, it got back, actually, but uh, in those days, uh, all the dark rooms closed in San Francisco because of AIDS, the HIV and, uh, and AIDS. Um, but if you knew your way around there, it was easy. There were whole houses being turned into sex clubs. So. Uh, what differences did you experience between the San Francisco scene mm -hmm. versus what you knew in Amsterdam? Mm -hmm. 
Um, San Francisco is more open. You could walk down really? the streets in your leather, yeah. Especially in Mark, uh, South of Market, it was, it was great. I had I had a good I had good experiences over there being in leather. Go to the Eagle, go to the beer busts, and um, you saw you saw people on the streets in leather, and in Amsterdam you didn't see that. Oh, okay. It all happened in in in, in the Warmerstraat and in the bars. And, uh, I was pleased to find that uh, guys were more uh, in, guys in San Francisco were more of a uh, a community than in Amsterdam. Really? Yeah, really. Oh. Everybody knows each other, knew each other over there, and uh, friendships were easier. Hmm. I'm a little surprised to Why? hear that. Your experience is differently? Well, I think that the Dutch scene is very, um, more true to form. Yeah, but in those days it was really a small, a small scene. Okay. So, you said that when you were in San Francisco that the young gay men could not have cared less about safer sex practices. This was the early 90s. Why yeah. was that the case? Um, ignorance, I think. But um, also the younger, the younger guys in San Francisco didn't experience all the deaths. And, um, and all their friends dying. I was, I was, I was. I came out early, so uh, for me, a lot of guys in my, in my, uh, in, at, a lot of friends of mine died at those days, and I'm, I'm still lucky that I have can sit here, to be honest. Um, but the younger guys who grew up after that uh, didn't experience that, and. Never, never had to go to a funeral of, of, a, of, of a good friend. Um, so I think they're more inhibited and more, they, could, they couldn't care less about it. Hmm. That's a little bit shocking considering the information at that time. Yeah. But I think if you don't look at it, you don't, uh, or you, if you look away, it's not in your neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. But your travels to the United States have not always been good. Nope. They've not always been <laughs> positive. I was working for a big hotel chain um, uh, at my internship. They offered me uh, a very good job in San Francisco so I could transfer over there. Um, but the problem is I had to get my green card. and. Um, since I was not married then, uh, I had to get married. Um, but my green card, uh, my green card for my for my internship expired, so I had to go back to Holland. So I married over here with an American, a very good friend of mine. Um, but it turned out I had to take an HIV test for uh, applying for the green card, and um, it turned out bad. Um, that was more or less the, the time that I found out I was HIV positive as well, back in 92. And um, I couldn't go back to the, uh, to the States anymore. And uh, so more or less uh, my career was ruined. So I had to go back to Amsterdam. And which what, I did. What did you do when you got back to Amsterdam? Um, I started working in the clubs again. And uh, for a couple of years, uh, until I met my ex-boyfriend, and um, which I'm, who I met at the Argos, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and he decided, together with me, that uh, I should not work in the, at the nightlife anymore. So, um, and we more or less figured out something for me to do, which. Uh, eventually ended up in opening my own business. Before we jump to that, when we met to prepare for this interview, yeah. you mentioned that the Berlin, the German leather scene, is incredible. And I think that is the uh, iconic leather scene today. What are your thoughts on that? 
I think the leather scene in Amsterdam was more flourishing in those days than the scene in Berlin, to oh, be honest. Okay. Uh, Amsterdam was the gay capital of Europe. A lot of guys from the States always came to Amsterdam. A lot of guys from around the world came to Amsterdam. And um, Berlin took over year, many years later, actually. Okay. What are your thoughts on that today? Um, I like Berlin, but uh, I'm born and raised in Amsterdam, and I'm, I think it's a pity that the whole scene died down. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel, let me rephrase that, why do you feel that it's really died down in Amsterdam? Um, because all the, all the bars are closing down, actually. Uh, also, uh, a lot of guys from Amsterdam go to Berlin or Antwerp to, or Cologne to have fun. Um, and um, Amsterdam is not attractive for gay tourists anymore. It's too expensive. Uh, mm. They price themselves out of the market, and it's 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 too busy with uh, tourists having stag parties and that sort of thing. Yeah. So it's it's a completely different tourist market right now. And as a gay myself. I would not go to Amsterdam with those hotel prices and the prices for restaurants and everything. But do you feel that it's the tourists that caused the bars to close, or is there some other reason that's... No, great? that's not a reason, and that's called the internet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Amsterdam is really, really, it's, st it's still really an attractive city. I still love it, and uh, I always will. Um, but the internet made sure that all the gay bars are closing down. I think that's a worldwide problem, actually. It is. We see it all over. We do. Yeah. yeah. But you mentioned that you discovered you were HIV positive mm -hmm. very early on. And you also said at one point when we prepared for this interview that you were one of the first people to go on the cocktail. So yeah. tell us about that. Uh, well, I, just, I found out that I was HIV positive in 19. Was it? Yeah, it was 92. Uh, 91, 92. Um, luckily for me, that they didn't put me on ACT because my T cells were, my T cells were still great uh, and good, and I could postpone taking medication for another four years. And um, after those four years, uh, the first, the first cocktails went. Uh, were, uh, were invented, so um, yeah, I was lucky that I could postpone taking medication until that happened. Um, so in '95, I started to take my birth pills. What are your thoughts on the HIV treatments today? Um, this is my sixth cocktail, and I'm taking this one for many years now. So. Um, Actually, I'm very healthy and very happy. Uh, only the side effects of taking pills 26 years um, are actually worse than the cause itself. So, Why is that? Um, because the pills ruin, are ruining your body from inside. Okay. Taking pills for 26 years is taking a, take, taking effect. So uh, I'm still feeling fine, but. Uh, taking uh, cholesterol medications, I have diabetes, I have oh my. Uh, stomach problems, and that's all because of the medication, not because of the HIV. Oh, I see, I see. But I'm still feeling pretty healthy, and I, uh, I can do whatever I want, so I'm, I'm not complaining about it. What are your thoughts on people who see the cocktails today as basically a controlled disease similar to diabetes. What do you have to say to that? Um, if you still have a choice of getting infected by HIV, um, make sure that you don't get it because taking pills for 26 years is a nightmare. Okay. Better not. That's okay. But it's their, own, it's their own life, it's their own body, and, and I'm not the guy that has to tell people what to do or what to do. I can only advise them and yeah. out of my experience. And that's what I would say. When you were younger, mm -hmm. 
You were against gay marriage. <laughs> Why was that the case? Um, I'm, 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 I'm trying to explain this. Um, I think to be integrated in society, um, we don't have to do this. We don't have to do exactly the same as all the straights do. I was against it because um, I think we, we, we prove our relationships uh, as well, uh, just living together. In Holland, we had the same rights. We could have a samenleving contract, so that's on the same level as a marriage. And um, the whole idea of marriage didn't attract me. And, um, I was not only against gay marriage, I was against straight marriage. Oh. But um, look who's talking because I'm married now for 12 years. Why did your <laughs> point of view change? Um, actually, to put it bluntly, because it was it was it was easy for me and my and my, and my boyfriend and my husband now uh, legally to buy a house. We we could we could easy, it was easier. Okay. Um, but <laughs> when the day was there, I was really happy that I did it. So now I can understand how people got married. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us um, how and why black bodies started. How it started. Um, and also perhaps tell us what it is in Amsterdam. What do you mean, what it is? Tell us a little bit about the shop, the shop. And, and all of that. Um, Black Body is a fetish shop. Um, I started it almost 25 years ago, 24 to be exactly next year, we're turning 25. Um, I started out as a specialist in rubber. Um, my ex-boyfriend, who I talked about already, um, and I were heavily into rubber 24 years ago. And um, we always had to go to London to get it, because in okay. Holland we couldn't get anything. There was a, some pieces at Rob, some pieces at Expectations, but that was about it. So we always went to London to buy it, and um, we started talking to the guys who were producing it over there, and um, then the idea started to start the shop in Amsterdam. So that was 24 years ago. And from 90% rubber at that time, uh, including some toys and some leather, um, right now we have a shop that's about 40% leather and rubber and 60% sportswear from brands like Boxer and Addictive. Um, because the whole market changed, the whole fetish scene changed. Oh, what did? Sorry? The whole market changed, okay. and the fetish scene uh, changed as well. Uh, uh, so okay. um, we changed with it. and. For us, it was a way to survive the crisis. What crisis do you mean? The, the economical crisis in 2008, uh, uh, which really uh, hit us twice because, uh, now first of all, there were no tourists in Amsterdam. Second of all, the whole DVD market collapsed and I was selling a lot of DVDs back then. So okay. then uh, Sportswear came around. We moved to a bigger shop in Kerkstraat. And, uh, Right now we have a pretty, a pretty, pretty big sportswear collection, Boxer, Cell Block, Addicted, our own brand in rubber. Uh, we do some leather as well, so it's pretty much of everything. So. What plans do you have for the shop in the future? Hmm. That all depends how internet is developing because 30% uh, <laughs> of our shop, 30% uh, of our turnover is online. So 70% um, is still shop, and that's enough to keep the shop open. But um, if we're, I don't know how that's going to change. I have no idea if people are still coming to Amsterdam to the shop to buy it. Uh, okay. So uh, we have, we even have a lot of customers, on, uh, online customers that come from Holland, and don't bother to come to Amsterdam anymore. Wow, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. How has Black Body? benefited the Amsterdam community? Um, we more or less introduced the rubber scene in Amsterdam. <laughs> okay. Um, got more 
uh, accepted in, into the leather scene, because that was hard in the beginning. Rubber was something completely different than leather, but I, um, I have a lot of fetishes, leather, rubber, uh, uniforms. So for me, it was uh, more or less when Black Body, uh, when, Black, when Black Body opened up, that uh, rubber was more accessible to people. So more and more people started wearing rubber into the leather scene as well. Um, what are your thoughts on that change in the scene? I think it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when you used to, when you used to go to part, leather parties 25 years ago, you only see guys running around in black leather and um, hardly any rubber. There was some rubber, but not a lot. And that all changed a lot, and I think that's good because there's a lot of people with a lot of different fetishes. Okay. And I think it's good that they're mixed. If you could change mm -hmm. any aspect of your leather fetish journey, would you change anything? Probably not. Why not? Because I, because I enjoyed my life so far, and I joined, I joined, always enjoyed the scene. Uh, the only thing I would change is getting away, people away from their computers and start going uh, out again. I agree. I miss that. I really miss that. I'm not really into the big parties, but uh, I like cruising in the small bars. And I miss that. What's the biggest misconception about you? Uh, well, most of the people know me from the business. So they don't know me at all. Um, my the biggest mixed misconception I think people think that I'm really unapproachable, but uh, the people that know me think differently, and they know me. Well, Rick, I would like to thank you for a lovely interview You're here in welcome. Antwerp at Darklands during Belgian Leather Pride. Thank you for driving down from Amsterdam today no to do this. I, was, I love being here, so it was great to do. Lovely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right.